Back for round two on the WOSN Selection Show, Division 4 action we're going to talk about over the next 60 or so minutes. I'm Patrick Kamler. Welcome back to the WOSN Selection Show. And joined once again by the best in the biz, Mark Schein, Miles Holiday, Aaron Matthews, and Evan Skilder. Guys, plenty of basketball to talk about. Some of you guys were busy earlier this week with basketball action, and uh, we've got plenty to come up this week. But... We're going to get right into it as we uh, break down the brackets and start talking about some postseason basketball. We're going to start in the Elida District tonight looking at Division Four. Of course, that is Columbus Grove. And as you take a look at that, it's Columbus Grove. And I'll have an interview with uh, head coach Chris Sauter here in just a minute. But Columbus Grove at right now 14-2. and two. Looking pretty good in that district. you got to look also uh, Kaleida, Lincoln View. It, it really looks like you're going to have... Kaleida, Lincoln View, matching up in that second round, and Columbus Grove maybe getting all the way through, at least they run into one of those teams. Well, I wouldn't go to sleep, though, on, on Kaleida. You know, they've got a, a, a player, in yeah. Luke Earhart, who can flat out score when you got, and rebound. And when you got a guy like that that you can go to in a tournament when you need a basket, yeah, I think you're probably right. I think Lincoln View's a favorite, but I wouldn't go to sleep on, on Kaleida right there. It's not a game you want to miss either. Sorry, Patrick. Yeah. They play each other. Uh, there are many teams that can match up physically with Columbus Grove, but Kaleida is certainly one of those teams. Uh, that would be a great matchup to see in the playoffs. And we assume that Kaleida Lincoln View will be that next round matchup. You know, again, as we said a couple of different times last night, anything can happen, but you got to think it's going to be Lancers, Wildcats in that lower part of that bracket. And whoever comes out of that, and it's a the point well taken that uh, Mark Shine just made. Uh, they're going to be a handful for uh, Columbus Grove, assuming that either PG or Fort Jennings doesn't pull off the upset. You know, guys, the scary thing about this district, it is, in my opinion, the number one district in the state of Ohio in Division IV. We have two programs with five losses or less that are going to be hanging up the basketballs at that Friday night sectional final, potentially. That's a shame, but it also is proof that just how good this district really is. And that's going to be one of the things that we see as we get more into this particular division. There's going to be a lot of teams that you wouldn't think they'd be done that early. But just because of the, the competition, Kaleida, Lincoln View, and Grove are probably teams that have legs to go district finals further on than that. But it's unfortunate. We're only going to see one of those teams advance out of this district. The thing with like Grove, though, is they're a little bit injured. Is that right, Aaron? Yep. Yeah. yeah. you got Gabe Clement, who's out with an ankle injury. From the sounds of it, Gabe's going to miss the regular season at least you know, the next uh, two weeks. You know, get him ready for the tournament time. That's where Columbus Grove wants to make their money, you know, having unfinished business from a year ago. Yeah, so could you imagine not having all your parts and you go to coach specialty team? I mean, that's, you're gonna, that's running a really tough risk of yeah. advancing with that defense that they play there. And I had a chance to sit down and talk to head coach Chris Sauter of Columbus Grove. Uh, this interview segment brought to you by Hawker Drywall. And let's hear from the coach of the Columbus Grove Bulldogs. Joining us on the selection show is Columbus Grove head coach Chris Sauter. First of all, coach, Hey, it's got to feel good to be picked for the number one seed in your uh, in your bracket this season. Yeah, it does. I mean, we've kind of had a rough go of things with some injuries and illness, but um, our kids have battled through, and um, we're very fortunate yesterday to come away with the one seed. You, as you mentioned, you've had some bumps in the road. You've had some injuries. You, you've had some things to overcome. Uh, how have you seen your uh, your kids grow through that that process, and how have you seen your – uh, leadership on the team. I, sometimes I say senior leadership, but leadership can be at, at any grade level. Um, but how, how have you seen your your leadership on your team step up over the last couple of months? Well, our big leader is Gabe Clement. Unfortunately, he's the one who keeps getting hurt. So uh, he's really been our leader, even from the bench when he's been hurt. And he just got hurt again Friday and he's out for another two to three weeks with a sprained ankle. So we're going to rely on his leadership from the bench because Blake and Tate, they're more they're just going to play hard, do what they do, um, and not real vocal leaders. But I think Blake is starting to see that he needs to be more of that vocal leader on our team with Gabe being out. Um, and our, our, you know, our younger kids, they've been through this at the beginning of the year with people being hurt um, and sick. And so hopefully that experience early on will help us these last couple of weeks of the season until Gabe gets back healthy. And, and how has Gabe reacted to this latest setback? Because it's never easy for an athlete to go down with an injury, particularly twice in one season. Yeah, he's, I mean, he was pretty positive about it. Just, you know, you get the news that it's just a sprain. It's not broken and something he can come back from. And 
Um, he was kind of bummed. He went and they told him two to three weeks. And then he went and saw somebody else. He started doing treatment and he thought he could be back in a week or two. So he's gotten some, he, nobody wants to be hurt, but the news he's gotten has been pretty good. Awesome. Very glad to hear that and hope he gets back uh, as soon as possible. And I'm sure you do too. Um, we, we've talked to some of your guys about reacting to this season. Your season ended abruptly uh, last year. You're headed for regional final against Parkway and then COVID happened and, and none of that took place. What impact did that have on your off season and what impact have you seen it have on your regular season so far? Well, just, you can't take anything for granted. I mean, you tell them, Hey, this could be the last game you ever play. And we just went through that last year. It could literally be the last game they play. So I think they have a little bit of a sense of urgency, you know, especially with all the seniors we have, but especially with what happened last year, um, the kids are pretty focused and dialed in and they want to, you know, finish the season this year, hopefully, you know, make a long tournament run and kind of, you're never going to make up for what happened last year, but you know, we want to try to get back to where we were last year and see if we can finish the job. Absolutely. You had a 13 game winning streak snapped here recently. Does that provide a benefit in any way that you, that you kind of see what your potential vulnerabilities are heading into the postseason instead of carrying a, what, what would have been a 16 or 17 game winning streak heading into the playoffs? Yeah, I mean, they definitely exposed us in a couple areas. Um, and we definitely realized how much we miss uh, having Gabe on the court. So it, it definitely is going to focus, refocus us on things that we can do better. Because, um, you know, way Patrick or way Jackson Center played Saturday night, you know, people get that film, we're going to see the same kind of you know, aggressive defense that they uh, put on us Saturday night. So our kids have to learn to react to that, respond to it, and hopefully get better because of it. Taking a look at the the bracket that you're in, that Elida district, and there's a couple of uh, certainly intriguing possibilities as far as as matchups go. Is there is there anything that you're looking at that you're looking down the road and thinking that hmm that could be a that could be quite a formidable matchup or that could be a matchup that might uh, might be really interesting for us to uh, to game plan against in the next couple of weeks. Well, for us and for pretty much everybody in this bracket, it's like you have to play somebody twice or multiple teams twice if you want to get out of it. You know, our first game is going to be PG for Jennings. Pandora gave us a pretty tough game uh, a week ago, Tuesday. Um you know, we've got Kaleida, who's a rivalry. You know, Lincoln View's tough. But we've played all these teams except Corey Rawson and St. John's. So for us to make it through, we've, we're pretty aware that we're going to have to beat, you know, three or four teams that we've already played this season. And it's not easy to beat teams twice. Um, it was hard last year to to run that district. I think it's it's got to be one of the toughest districts around, you know, looking at some of the teams that are in there. So, um, yeah, it's just tough beating teams twice. Is it more difficult? You mentioned beating teams twice. Do you, do you have a preference? Would you rather try and, uh, and and go up against someone, maybe not necessarily beat them, I won't go that far, but do you have a preference in going up against somebody again or going up against someone that you've never uh, competed against before? Because I said you, there's a couple teams in this bracket that you might come up against that you haven't played this season. Correct. Yeah, I, I mean – I've even said, gosh, just send us somewhere else so we can play somebody different. <laughs> you know, you get kind of tired of seeing the same teams over and over again. Um, but, you know, that's just the way the way it is the last couple of years for us in this Elida district. So, um, yeah, if we got to see St. John's or Corey Austin, that means they knocked off a couple of really good teams in Crestview and Ottaville. So um, that it would be neat to play one of those two teams. Um, to play somebody different. But, I mean, if they're beating Crestview and Ottaville, they're really, really good basketball teams, and it would definitely be a challenge for us if we're able to get that far. Columbus Grove head coach Chris Sauter. Coach, thanks for your time. Uh, uh, best of luck to you and your matchup coming up against either Pandora Gilboa or Fort Jennings, and good luck to you the rest of the season. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Yeah, again, thanks a lot to the coach. And you had a chance to check out Columbus Grove this week. They're having to settle in without Clement, and not too bad. Yeah, two nights ago they played Lipsick. Uh, I had that game with uh, with Darn Evergall and 
It took both teams a while to get going. I don't think anyone scored for the first four and a half minutes of the game. Uh, but once they did, and especially in the second half for Columbus Grove, they really started to put things together. That's a really deep basketball team. Uh, yeah, Gabe Clemens, a, a huge part of what they do offensively and defensively. Uh, but Coach Sauter mentioned uh, Tate Bernesser. He mentioned Blake Reynolds. Those two play so well together. Those mm -hmm. three with Gabe Clement play really well together. But those two together, they're fantastic. They traded buckets on about eight straight possessions uh, Tuesday night. And that was great to see, but but they have guys filling in. Jackson Schrader does a nice job handling the basketball. Um, they had Bo Bernesser, uh, a freshman, come in and, and hit some big buckets. Trey Sauter, uh, Coach Sauter's son, does a nice job as well. So that's a very deep team, and a team that plays that physical is, is just a, a tough out no matter who's on the court. And Coach referenced the fact that being a tough district. We've only shown you the top half so far. Let's take a look at the bottom half. And uh, just as good teams on the bottom part of that bracket as there are on the top. Convoy, Crestview. I said Convoy. I don't know why I did that. Crestview. We all know they're in Convoy. Uh, getting the three seed there. And we mentioned Lipsick, Delphi, St. John's. An interesting matchup, Aaron Matthews, I think, with Lipsick and St. John's. Lipsick is, is kind of going cold a little bit at not the time of the year that you want to have that happen. Yeah, I mean, Lipsick at 13 and 5 now. Um, they, they were one of those teams that I was talking about that could have five losses or less and have their season come to an end in the sectional final. Same, same can be said with Crestview. And then you've got Delta St. John's, who Tuesday night absolutely took care of business against Bath and it may have been the best game that the Jays have played this year. And they're doing it without... You know, Isaac uh, Fairchild, who was a guy who played and contributed a lot last year for them. Um, Landon Grothaus, a sophomore, tore his ACL in football, came back back in mid-January. He's played well off the bench, averaging about eight points a game. Matthew Canings, their leading scorer, at 11 points per contest. The Jays, if they can take care, you know, keep close with St. Henry, that's a tough matchup for them Friday night. They got a nice win over Allen East. You know, Delta St. John's with that experience and that tradition that they have come tournament time could be a very tough game for Lipsick in round one. And with Autoville getting the number two seed coming out of that particular bottom part of the bracket, Mark, Autoville, it just seems like these last few years, Autoville always a tough out when you get to this part of the playoffs. If they can keep Seaver healthy, and of course that's been a problem now for all three years, he's been a varsity basketball player, keeping him on the floor. But when you had that 6 7 presence in the middle, and then you got uh, Turbin to go along with him, and Miller and some of those other guys that play on the, on the role players. They're very, very good. They have a win over Columbus Grove, but admittedly at that point in time, Columbus Grove was not healthy, did not have Burnesser, and did not have uh, Clemens, as we talked yeah. about earlier. So they have a win then, but if you look at what happened the following week, Columbus Grove beats Crestview at Crestview by six without those two guys, and the guys you mentioned stepping up and playing for them stepped in. So Aaron's mentioned it before. This is a tremendous district, and you just hope everybody has healthy people on the floor. Yeah, and, look, and looking at Ottoville, you know, they've got Lima Central Catholic this week. They've got a matchup with Shawnee. And breaking news, folks, that's going to be live next Tuesday night here on WOSN. <laughs> uh, then they got to go to Wayne Trace. And Wayne Trace is never an easy place to play. Plus, they got to play Lipsick this Saturday night in a PCL matchup. They win that. They win the PCL outright. But, you know, their statement came this past Saturday at the OG Winter Classic. They put 100 points up on Toledo Rogers, beat them 100 to 31. Josh Turbin sets a single game record with 45 points. He also breaks the school's all-time scoring mark as well. Such a dynamic player. And this, in that game, watching them at OG was the best I've seen Ottoville look since Keith Utendorf took over four years ago. Real quick, Evan. Yeah, one thing to, to keep in mind, if you're looking down the road a little bit, an Ottoville Crestview matchup would be fun ooh, to see ooh, as well. We had it. that on WOSN earlier this yeah. year. Overtime win for, uh, for Ottoville. Hard-fought game. Really fun to watch. Yep. Two of the best players in the area going at it. Yeah, Turbin 29, Essler 21, and 11 boards. That, that was a great basketball game. That would be a wonderful game to see down, your, down the road. And don't count out Crestview, guys. Mm -hmm. you know, Kalen, Essler. Played his best game last uh, Friday night when it was story time with Mark, Mark and Jerry. <laughs> yeah. That was a great 29 points, 17 rebounds. I believe he had six uh, block shots as well. Followed it up, had a decent game in the loss to Van Wert on uh, Tuesday night as well. They seem to be playing very good ball right now too, and they've got to have Kalen step up too. Elida District looking very good, very competitive. As always, as we uh, have broken that down, we're going to take, step away, take a quick break. When we come back, it's off to Finley. Take a look at the Liberty Benton District in Division Four. This is the WOSN Selection Show.
Welcome back to the WOSN Selection Show, and we are off to Fenley, Liberty Benton District, and looking at some of the BVC teams that are out there. You see uh, Aaron Matthews and Matt Table. We'll have them on a little bit later in the program. Macomb yeah. getting the bye with the 11th seed as we take a look at the top half of the Fenley District. And uh, the, the Blanchard Valley Conference has been interesting, to say the least, in terms of it's been extremely competitive is certainly one way to take a look at it. Uh, five teams right now in a tie for first place. Uh, Van Lu, not one of those teams, getting the nine seed there. It, but you see Old Fort there with the one seed. You, you kind of look at that and go, Old Fort, Carey, probably going to be in your district semifinal there. Yeah, good possibility. Uh, it's been a good year for Van Lu, though, guys. Seven mm -hmm. and eight, um, a program that last year only won like two games. Seven wins, that's mammoth for a school the size of Van Lu, one of the smallest schools in Division Four uh, in the state of Ohio. But really, to me, what jumps out is the matchup down at the bottom side of the bracket. If you're going to have to pick a matchup that you had to go and watch, it would be Fremont St. Joe, Central Catholic, and Arlington. And Arlington, one of those teams that some would say has been a bit of a disappointment this year. Ten seniors, a lot of expectations, team that, you know, could play for a BBC title. And they've lost some games, and quite frankly, they should have won this year, too. Yeah, we go and take a look at that bottom half of that bracket again. Arlington it has been one of those head-scratching teams that half game behind the leaders in the BBC, but... You know, at 10 and 7, you just you looked at the talent that was on the team. You looked at kind of how it was assembled, and you thought, man, they were going to be better than 10 and 7 at this point in the season and getting possibly a higher seed in that district. But that is where they sit, and that's a game, as you said, competitive, could go either way. And Tiffin Calvert, they're sitting in the, uh, in the two spot, hard northern, with a uh, respectable over 500 this season as well. So um, a lot of interesting matchups, but it's going to be hard-pressed to knock off, I think, either one of the two top seeds. Well, the thing with the Arlington, though, is they have Brandon Hall, a point guard that mm -hmm. can seemingly get to the middle of the lane anytime he wants. Sometimes that's a detriment, though, to your team if a point guard has a scoring first mentality. And so they have the trouble sharing the ball this year. So if they get, to get him to distribute and then score when they need him to, then they're going to be a very deadly team in this tournament. The other thing is when you have a team that in, in their mind, perhaps didn't have the season that they like. It becomes season number two, and watch out. We're going to do something now and prove that the rest of the season wasn't the way you want it to be. We're going to get after it now. So sometimes that happens too. Perhaps. Jason Vermillion is such a good he coach. He is a great he coach. Is, yeah. What, yeah. 200 plus wins now? Over 300. Over 300 wins yeah. now. So he's, again, obviously, done a great job there. He great. does it with all kinds of different styles. Yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah great coach, even better person. I'll, yep. I'll Absolutely. That. Really, really yep. enjoy my time with him. Yeah, always possible to get that second season boost, and we've seen teams do it before. Perhaps Arlington is the next one to do it. That is, uh, that's the Finley bracket. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, it's off to Defiance. We'll take a look at those teams, and we'll have more in that with the Antwerp head coach. This is WOSN Selection Show. Back here on the WOSN Selection Show as we head up to Defiance. Taking a look at the top half of that bracket as well. We'll start Antwerp getting the number one seed, and they'll match up with the winner of Stryker or Hilltop. And then Ayersville, Emmanuel Christian, Fayette, and Montpelier going on down the line. A bracket, Miles Holiday looking pretty, pretty good for Antwerp. Look at the bottom half of it as well. Toledo Christian at 14 and 3 getting the number two seed. And you see right down the line there, Eden, North Central, uh, Pettisville and Hicksville in the 3-7 matchup. Edgerton and Holgate is your 5-9 matchup. And uh, Pettisville looks like they could possibly kind of make a run in there. And it's one of these where you just don't want to look at the records and go, well, okay, we'll just go ahead and, and, and plot this out. But you, uh, you look at the top part of that bracket and right. Antwerp just really looks like a tough matchup for anybody. Well, I absolutely love Antwerp because they are the <laughs> ultimate warriors. They'll play anybody, anytime, anywhere, and they'll play any kind of style. They are tough. Coach Billman has got them rocking and rolling. He loaded the spaceship with the rocket fuel and headed on the road everywhere this year. Or had teams come to them. Uh, did Antwerp their lone loss came that buzzer beater to Wayne Trace that we had on WOSN. Just a great ball club to watch. And you look at the other side of that bracket, it was Toledo Christian. Um, you know, that's a very, very good ball club. Coach McQuinney's done an outstanding job. Uh, in his tenure there too. Yeah, those two matched up in the exact same spot a year ago. We had that game and the first half was dominated by TC because it was a guard oriented game. Then when Antwerp remembered, hey, let's pound the post, that's when things turned around so it could conceivably get there again. Yeah. Miles Holiday earlier was able to shake the ropes with uh, Antwerp head coach <laughs> Doug Billman. Let's listen to that now. Uh, coach Doug Billman with the Antwerp. Uh, congratulations on another great season, coach. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, it's been 
It's been a great ride. We've played some really quality teams. Uh, kids have responded to a lot of different adversity, at, you know, throughout the year. So um, we're still rolling, but uh, it's been a fun one so far. Yeah, how exciting is this time of year when you get rolling into the tournament? You know, it, it's it's just it's just a special time of year. You guys all know that uh, you know anybody who watches any sort of basketball, uh, he knows what tournament time is and just how special it can be. Um, it, you know, just with with great games, great atmospheres. Um, and, and, and quality competition throughout. So um, it, it's, 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 it's good basketball, and it, it's, it's, it's the highest competition that, uh, that you're going to see each night out. So it, it's, it's about preparing and, and going after it and trying to get things done. There are a lot of teams that you have familiarity with. Uh, you know, of course, Toledo Christian, we all know about that from last year, and you got Hicksville, Ayersville, Holgate, host of other schools. Does that help you or does that hurt you? Well, I think familiarity is, is certainly. I think it, it's it's helpful for our kids. They have a good understanding of of personnel because we've played before, we've seen them before, we've seen them throughout the season. Um, so I I think it's 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 certainly a thing that that helps us. Um, you know, but it's also you 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 look at the other side of things. You know, coaches are going to know so much about us as well. Uh, you know, so it's it's about you know, executing it here and once you get in the tournament, just because of the familiarity, you know, amongst opponents. Look at all, all the teams that you could conceivably play. Is there a style of play that concerns you? I, I don't think so because we've played, you know, kind of across the gamut throughout the season. Um, you know, you know, we've played that, uh, you know, possession by possession, the basketball game where it's it, it's physical and it's grinded out um, scenarios. Um, and we've played scenarios where, you know, it's it's a little bit more in transition, which is the way we, you know, we truly like to play. But uh, I think uh, the way our team is built, uh, my, you know, I, I think we can excel and, and do some things, uh, some quality things uh, in both styles of play. Now, you got some really battle-hardened guys. It's kind of a mix of guys that have been through the gamut before, like Jagger Landers and Lucas Krause. But, and then you got Mr. Big Shot, Landon Brewer. How important is it to have those guys with veteran leadership teach the young guy what tournament plays look like? Oh, I think it's just it's just huge. And, um, you know, our, our guys, have, you know, certainly, you know, those guys that have been through the trenches a little bit last year and even the year before, um, that have seen some things and done some things. Um, just to just to to have those guys on the floor to help calm scenarios, you know, for for our younger guys or even our guys that haven't been there yet, um, you know. So just to help keep things calm and just keep perspective a little bit while the you know while things are going on on the floor, whether it be a run from our opponent or whether it be um, you know just just a, a little adversity on the floor. So I think that's it's going to be big and that will help our 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 inexperienced players lean on those guys a little bit. When you talk to the kids about the tournament, do you take the big tournament approach or you t talk to them about one game at a time? It, it's one game at a time right now. Um, you know, at the start of the season, you, you, you paint the big picture a little bit and, and, you, and you just say, hey, you know, that, you know, just, you know, building from last year and you talk about taking the next step and, and then you kind of leave it at that. And then it's just a one game mentality. And, and you know, each opponent, uh, it, you know, brings a, brings something different to the table that you want to make sure that your your guys are ready for. And certainly, um, as tournament time comes around, there is absolutely no overlooking anything, any detail, any opponent. Um, so you have to be ready. So it's a one game mentality, without a doubt. Last question for you, Coach: The Antwerp Archers will keep dancing in the tournament if you if you do what? If we defend, um, you know, I think, I mean, that might be a, a very general answer that you're going to get, but, um, you know, you know, tournament time it comes down to defending well. Um, and then obviously the other side of it is offensive execution because you get into scenarios where, like we talked about, teams know each other, teams know you and know your, your tendencies pretty well. So can you still execute in those times? Uh, while also, you know, you, you better be good defensively. So, um, I think that if we can hang our head on some some good defensive possessions and then, um, you know, when it comes down nitty gritty time, if you can execute on offense and we feel like, uh, you know, having having a guy like Jagger or, or experienced point guard um, or experienced shooting guard like uh, Austin Leasty, I think, you know, some of those guys uh, may be able to rise to occasion that, that, that have been there before. Hey, Coach, who does the decorating for you in your office right there, man? Get a couple <laughs> pictures, will you? 
I, yeah, I need to, we need to do, do upgrade a little bit. You know, we do have the Archer blue uh, curtains back there, but uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, do it, you know, it's, you know, during the uh, early COVID scenario last <laughs> summer, we were, we were doing some remodeling. So the, the office is yet to be done. So interior designs by Doug Billman is not, you don't have your business cards yet, huh? <laughs> definitely not. Definitely not. And I'm sure nobody would be, would be looking me up. Well, let's hope that you keep going in basketball in the tournament and you don't have to work the side job, buddy. I appreciate your time and uh, go get them, Archers. Appreciate yeah, appreciate the coverage and go Archers. All right, thanks a lot, Coach. Well, Antwerp having designs on getting to the regional final, and they look like they could be in a pretty good position to do it. Yeah, Antwerp is, I think, <laughs> should be the favorite, right? They're, they're unbelievable. They have great guard play with Kraus and, of course, Jagger Landers inside. But uh, the bottom bracket, don't sleep on them, they, especially teams like Pettisville. If Pettisville can find a way to get healthy again. They're out without Josh uh, Hornig, their senior, who really does everything for them, plays great defense, scrappy guy. He's been out. If they can get him back or get someone to fill that spot, they'll be pretty good. Now, they lost to a Hicksville team last week that Hicksville looks like they're on the rise, too. So that bottom bracket, there is a lot of quality down in that bracket, and they could come up and bite a team like Antwerp. You say Hicksville certainly not a team to sleep on sitting at 7 and 10. As of the draw, they were sitting at 7 and 10. And you just never know. It could be a thing where Hicksville feels pretty good about their chances, right. but maybe Pettisville has a mind for revenge. Coach Tony Tier does a great job with Hicksville. He's got really playing good defense right now. Wasn't the case at the beginning of the year. Landon Turnbull, who led Northwest Ohio in scoring, was back this year. He hasn't scored as much, but he's dishing out four to five assists a game. So he's at 16 and five there. And then they have Jackson Bergman, who's six foot seven and a junior. And you can't teach that at six foot seven. He is unbelievable in the post. So you get two deadly guys like that, watch out for Hicksville. Well, go ahead, Mark. No, I just want to go off topic before we leave this. If you need <laughs> inspiration in the morning, Follow Coach Billman on Twitter oh, because every day you will get something positive from him that you can use in life. It's a wonderful thing. I start my day with it every day. Follow him on Twitter. It's great. And forget about basketball. Just follow him about life. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Do you know what his handle is? I just know it's on my phone. It comes up every day. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's Coach scared Billman. About whatever just go search for Doug here. Billman or Coach <laughs> Billman and you'll, you'll find it with no problems. <laughs> That's the Defiance Bracket. We're going to step away, take a quick break. When we come back, we are off to Wapak, and we'll have more here on the WOSN Selection Show. <laughs> Welcome back. This is the WOSN Selection Show right here on WOSN. Uh, D Bills 11 with a Z. That's how you yeah. can find Doug Billman on Twitter. Just all to, one word. Yeah, all one word. So just to circle back and tie the knot on that one. As we take you to the Wapak District now, and very familiar teams to a lot of folks here in West Central Ohio. Uh, very familiar with the number one seed of the Perry Commodores and head coach Matt Tabler. Matt Tabler, we'll hear from him in just a moment. But you see Upper Scioto Valley there sitting at the seventh seed. Uh, a compelling matchup there in the first round, USV and Spencerville. Spencerville starting to play some pretty good basketball at this point of the season. Uh, St. Henry matching up with Temple for recovery. New Knoxville there on the bottom half. Uh, but that USV Spencerville matchup, Aaron, looks to be, uh, that could be an interesting matchup between those two teams. Second straight year that they've played each other in round one of the tournament, and you got two very good coaches. Kevin Sensible has been at Spencerville now for 19 years as the head coach. Jeff Kleffer gets the most out of anybody in our area and a very short staff team this year. He's only got nine guys. He's playing six. But they, Jeff, year in and year out at USV, he gets these kids to compete. They buy in. Does an outstanding job. In Upper Scioto Valley, you, you always feel like that no matter what their record indicates, they're ready to go. They're ready to play basketball regardless of where they are in the, in the brackets. Yeah, that's a team that always just seems to come out and play tough, especially during playoff time. Uh, they're, they're well coached. Uh, but again, uh, it's a team that back when I was in high school, especially, I didn't want to go up against USB. The culture in that school is just one of, of just really, really tough kids. Uh, and I, I like them. I think, I think that's a tough out uh, in the tournament as no well. No doubt. Another tough out, certainly the Perry Commodores. Perry 14 and 3 when the bracket came was withdrawn. And Matt Taylor always seems to have his guys ready to go. He's really done a good job with this, this team, I think, particularly this year, because he's incorporated so many younger guys, newer guys, I should say, not necessarily younger, but, but newer guys into his program. And they have not played St. Henry Knox or Fort Recovery. So for them, when they get into that tournament, they're going to play teams they haven't played yet. I think a lot of coaches like those we saw earlier today. Yeah, they had a nice win on Tuesday night over uh, Miller City and Matt. Point blank said that this was the best basketball game we played for 32 minutes this year. 
Aaron Matthews earlier on caught up with head coach Matt Tabler. Let's take a look at it now. We continue on the WOSN Selection Show. We're going to talk the Wapakoneta District bracket now, the top seed, the Perry Commodores. Matt Tabler, the head coach, and uh, Matt, congratulations on the one. There was an uncertain district. This would probably be the second most uncertain one with the Elida one, obviously, uh, just down the street from us here. But it really seemed between you guys and Minster, it was going to be the number one or two seed. In the head-to-head, -head, though, that seemed to win out for you when you guys beat Minster a couple weeks ago. Exactly. Uh, I think that it, it, we, we would have been satisfied with a one or two. It's nice to be put up on that top line, but uh, we, we really were playing for that buy. Um, Any time that you can get uh, advance um, well, one step closer to your goals without playing a game, that's always nice. Um, but we told our kids they earned it. Um, we played a tough schedule. We've toughened it up since 17. Um, that was kind of the, the nick on Perry, that we played a soft schedule and our league wasn't as tough. We were still capable of making a state Final Four, but we wanted to get it tough because we knew we had some, some players coming. and We played a tough schedule, and uh, we went 5-0 and against the sectional, and uh, we felt like we had a pretty good resume, and, and like we told our kids, they earned it. You know, when you do look at your schedule, it, it takes me back to, you know, when you played Shawnee, they, they took care of you guys pretty handily but it was a great teaching tool for you moving forward. Then you move down the road and get to last weekend. You play Lormy. Last year, they beat you into the ground in their place. This year, you returned favor. Exactly. Uh, it's, it's felt like two seasons, though. You know, we had to take a, a little break uh, there at the end of December, right after we played Shawnee and um, losing by 30. It, it taught a lot of lessons. Um, and what we needed to do was toughen our defense up. You're not going to win games giving up 77 points. I mean, all it be that we're playing the number one team in the state in Division Two. But uh, we learned from that a little bit. And then I think we came back a little sluggish from the break and, and played LCC and USV, and our defense just wasn't there. And then we started to catch our feet as we played Minster. And then I think we played one of our best defensive efforts against Fort Warmy, who's well coached and in a regional every year. And so. Uh, I think it's given us a lot of momentum um, moving forward. But we're just trying to sell to our kids that if you want to get your goals, and uh, which is, you know, that we set out from the beginning, you have to play defense. And I think we're starting to guard now. You talk about your guys playing defense and ratcheting up their game uh, from an individual perspective. Ryan Yank seems to me, since the Ridgemont game, has really turned the corner for you guys. Man, he's been a beast. I, I, I mean, he is all over the floor defensively. Um, on the boards, um, hounding his man, um, did a fantastic job in the post against some very good post players that we've played against in Minster and, and, and um, um, Fort Lormie, and just did an excellent job on those guys. And um, his, his effort then it just translate from the defensive end to the offensive end, and that's what we're trying to sell to the kids, that if you can guard and defend people, that will you know, spur your offense on a little more, and it will also help us get into our transition game, what we're trying to do. And, He's played probably in the last five, six games, his best six games of his career. Yeah, and another guy that's just been Mr. You know, reliable this year has been Bobby Knight. Well, uh, Perry, we, we need a point guard. If you're going to play like we play, you need a commander and a chief out there. And um, we've had some good, good point guards across the years, you know, going all the way back to um, some guys when I first started. But, you know, and Jacoby Lane Harvey and, and Jamal Whiteside. And now Bubby's just picked it up. He got to play against uh, Jamal as a freshman, and he was still learning as a freshman sophomore. And the great thing is he's still learning, but he's averaging 16 and a half points for us and, and getting about five or six assists a game. And he has been um, obviously our most valuable player, but he gets everybody involved. And, and a, a, as our team goes, or as Bubby goes, our team goes. So um, we look for him to be that leader out there, and, and he's really done a great job. Matt, let's, uh, let's go back to the Wapakoneta district here. And obviously, it's a very MAC-heavy district, as it has been. Um, when you look at the brackets here, what, what was something that maybe stood out to you? I mean, to me, it was you know St. Henry in that three seed, New Bremen in the four seed. You knew that that could go either way, in my opinion, even as far down to a five or six, potentially. Yeah, it's spread out. And if you look at our um, seeds, you know, one through 14 or one through 12, however you want to look at it, um, it's, it's pretty even, you know. Um, it, it, it's not like top heavy like some of the sectionals that you have. You just gotta balance like, I mean, you're talking about the one and two that were separated by two points. You're talking about a three seed in uh, St. Henry and then Fort Recovery that 
could possibly match up against one another was a one-point game. Yep. Um, but uh, we'll have our work cut out without playing a MAC team going trying to make a district, and we we got to play the winner of USV and Spencerville, and oh, you know we'll just have to scout both of them all the way up to the matchup and watch that game. Um, a lot of people say you know you're fortunate not to have to play a MAC team to get to a district. Well, like I said, our, our our sectional is so even that even teams from the Northwest Conference and the Northwest Central Conference, you know, in the Northwest Central Conference, USV is going to be runners up in our league, and we possibly could face them, or we could possibly face a well-coached Spencerville team. Both teams are exceptionally well coached. Jeff Cleffer does a great job at USV. Kevin sends the ball in his 19 years at uh, Spencerville. But the nice thing, I'll be a little bit different this year, is the fact that you're going to be home for your sectional final. Yeah, that's a little strange, um, but uh, there's no place like home, right? And so uh, we've had a good record over the years at home. Um, it, it may be, you know, have a little home court advantage. Hopefully this is something that we look for in the future of playing those. You know, we had to play Waynesfield Goshen over at Coldwater. Coldwater's a great place. Mm -hmm. They put on a great tournament, and uh, it's just kind of crazy that two schools less than 10 miles apart are traveling over an hour to play a game. So. Um, hopefully they look at it in the future. It's nice to be at home, and maybe I'm not saying the same thing when we're a 9 or 10 and playing over at a Mac school. <laughs> Matt, we appreciate your time. Best of luck to you and the Commodores uh, throughout the rest of the regular season. You wrap things up here in the next two weeks and then get in that tournament run, and uh, hopefully the Commodores can make a nice run. All right, thanks, Aaron. All right, thanks a lot, Coach. Uh, nice job, Aaron. You know, uh, we've got some teams in this area that are going to be playing home games. It's kind of a new development recently with with everything kind of going on and you kind of get tired of saying that particular phrase but uh, a number of teams that we've mentioned that have the one or two seeds they're going to be playing home games in the playoffs yeah i know and, and i know why we're doing it you know with this COVID situation of finding gyms and i know why we're doing it i don't like it uh, i hope we don't continue with it I think it takes something special away from the tournament. The tournament used to be a place where number six might go get number one on a, on a neutral court and have a chance to win. Now you put number one on their home court, and, and I don't think that same type of opportunity occurs. Plus, it takes away the double headers used to get, sectional finals and sectional semifinals. And just, I, I just think it's, uh, and I know why we're doing it, I'll go back to that again, but I just hope we don't do it in the future because I think it takes something away from the tournament we're used to having. I'm on the fence about it, to be honest with you guys. I, I like, I, I love the neutral sites, don't get me wrong. I love the neutral sites, but I also love the fact of being rewarded for your body of work in the regular season, especially as a top one or two seed. So I want to see how it goes this year. I know it's been done in a bunch of other districts, the Southwest District, Northeast, everywhere else in the state of Ohio, the Northwest District, the last one to do it. Mm -hmm. I just want to see how it goes this year. I'm holding my judgment. I'm still a fan of the neutral site, but I also, I'm a fan of rewarding the hard work. If you're the number one seed, you're the number two seed, you don't need a home court. You need to go on to a neutral court and prove it there. You don't need an extra advantage of playing at home, too. Let's go on a bigger scale. Remember, in 1985, we're all basketball fans. Villanova upsets Georgetown. Neutral site game. If they play in Landover, uh, Maryland, at, at Georgetown's home court, do they still win that game? Yeah, remember a couple of years ago when VCU made that great run through the NCAA tournament? Those were all neutral site games. If they had to go on the road, would they have made that great run? We had to have a Super Bowl on, the new, on a home field. Not a fan. <laughs> I was not going to bring that up, oh, just for the Chiefs record. Fan. I was going to let that go. A sour Chiefs fan. My first, my first rant on that <laughs> be my last one, too. Yeah. I'm okay. The world, the sun came up Monday. I lived to fight another day, and we're okay. Yeah, but that sun wasn't as bright, was it? No. <laughs> and, 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 and then Tom Brady throws the trophy across the boat yeah. to Gronk. Yeah. Yeah. Seriously? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, line play. A boat! <laughs> the, the, the line play did that game in more than probably the home field necessarily. But, uh, I mean, that is something to certainly pay attention to, the idea that, you know, you think, well, it's, it's the same length of the court, it's the same baskets no matter where you go. But there is that element where you're the home team, you've done well, one, two, three seed, whatever the case may be, and you get to be in, in a familiar environment, even if the other team brings a good fan base with them. There's still that slight advantage. I think it's a, probably a little more slight maybe than you do, um, but it's still a little bit of an advantage, and you don't necessarily want that if you're facing that team. Well, that's my take on it. I mean, I, I, I've felt that way for a long, long time. I just like the neutral side. I think it's something special for the tournament. 
Um, I, I like some of the venues we've been able to play at in the past, too, when you've been able to go to the, to the real Lima Senior, not the one that's down there now, but the, real, the real Lima Senior. There were games there, and, and Elida Fieldhouse is a great place, and, and you bring in packed crowds from communities from all over the place, and I just think we lose something a little bit special that makes our tournament so good if we just go to, to home sites. Well, we'll see how that all shakes out and how progress goes in this case. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes you get seven inning double headers. It, it's, it's fine. That's my opinion on that. Well, we'll stick with basketball. When we come back, we will head with more action in the Wapak District. We'll look at the bottom half of that, and we'll sit down with Minster. Stay tuned. Back with you on the WOSN Selection Show as we look at the bottom half of the Wapak bracket. And... Minster is your number two seed getting the buy in that particular bracket. And well, I'll, I sat down with head coach Michael Clark. We'll have that here in just a moment. Minster having a, a really good season, building on the success they had last year and really parlaying that first MAC championship uh, this season since the 74 75 season. Parkway Ridgemont will get Minster, whoever wins that game, and that a, a potentially interesting matchup between those two teams. Be interesting to see which way that goes. Parkway was one of the teams that had their uh, season interrupted like many teams did this year. Lost some pieces of that, but Doug Hughes has done a great job of keeping his guys competitive. He really has. And also, this is a rematch. These uh, two programs played each other back in the end of January. It was a six-point game at, at Parkway uh, about a month ago from now. Uh, and, you know, Ridgemont's got two dynamic players, Mason Stuck, Landon Newland. Both, you know, both have good range. Both have good size. They're both going to get an opportunity to play at the next level. And Parkway, I, you can't say enough what Dylan Hughes has done. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, over 1,000 points, working on trying to become the school's all-time leading scorer. And, you know, getting the opportunity to play for his dad is awful special. Without a doubt. And I had a chance to sit down with Mike McClurg as we talked Minster basketball and a lot of things. We did a pretty good job breaking down the bracket. This segment brought to you by Minster Bank. Here's Coach McClurg. With me now on the WOSN Selection Show, Minster head coach Michael McClurg. Coach, first of all, you know, you guys have had – you had a really great season last year, and this year you just have topped that in a number of ways, uh, something that, you know, I, I mentioned to you a couple of days ago, uh, Minster clinched at least a share of its first MAC title since 74-75. Uh, that's, that's got to feel pretty good uh, to have on, the, on the, the resume, so to speak, for, for Minster this year. Absolutely, sure does. You know, last year's team that we had, you know, you just mentioned them. Um, you know, I think we were a few games away. We, you know, we hadn't figured out really how to win some of those close games. And I think, you know, this year we've been able to do that so far um, a little bit better. And uh, that feels good. You know, we had, a, we had a tough one Saturday night, Friday night, the previous Saturday night, previous Friday night. I mean, all real tight games. Um where we've, you know, really figured out how to win them in the second half. So um, that that's probably the the coolest part of it right now. You guys went to the district finals last year and you lost to to Parkway and Parkway, one of many schools that didn't actually finish their season. They were they were canceled due to COVID before everything else uh, got going. Uh, did did that success that you guys had last year? Did that heighten expectations for Minster basketball? Was there any type of additional pressure? that you felt or was put on you to even exceed what you did last year, this year? No, I don't think so. I mean, I felt like we had, um, we had a lot of our core group, a lot of our scoring, um, rebounding coming back this year. So, um, you know, from last year's team, I think last year's team, I would have considered young, even though we had a, a lot of seniors, um, they were, they, they more filled roles. Uh, Nixon was our leading scorer last year and, um, so I knew we had a lot coming back. I don't, I don't think it really had anything to do with expectations. Have you seen the the maturity kind of, of, of develop? Because you had you've had some guys come back. You said you had a young team. What have you seen in terms of development, um, maturity wise, or just gen general development? What have you seen from last season to this season? Yeah, I think I think so. I think we've grown up. You know, I I, I think, and you know, I, this is only my fifth year as a head coach, but I think when seniors are, um, you know, a big part of your team, it, it seems that's a big step. You know, seniors are a big deal, and you know, people don't necessarily think, or at least I did. And there's a big difference between a sophomore and a senior. But I do think when you're talking about maturity, um, you know, those extra two years are pretty important. And um, 
you know, I, I, you know, in terms of how we've grown and how mature we are, we with three starters back, but more lettermen than that back. And, you know, how they handle themselves, our point guards in the second year right now, he's doing a really nice job, just not scoring when he has to, but, you know, taking control of the pace of the game and things like that. And, you know, it was a lot more up and down last year than what it is. I mean, we still have bad moments, but, um, you know, it's just a, it's, it's more of a smoother ride than it was last year. You guys uh, selected for the number two seed in the Wapak district. How did it, how did it feel to be uh, selected by your fellow coaches to be the second team in the, in the division, or I'm sorry, in the district? Yeah, it was great. I mean, I I kind of felt like we might either get a one or a two. Um, we had lost up to Perry, um, so I felt like it could have been a two. Our point guard did not play that game, um, but we ended up getting a two. And uh, I think that's whether you're one of the two. I think the chips the chips kind of fell as we thought they would. Um, you know, you're gonna you know in this district, as you know. It's uh, it's going to be tough. It's going to be a tough sectional final. It's going to be a tough, you know, district semi. It's going to be a tough district final. And uh, any way you slice it, you're going to get good teams at guard and some players that can score it. And uh, he's going to have to play well to get out of the out of the sectional in the district. Your district really is one of the more intriguing ones in the area, particularly in Division Four, where you there are a lot of teams that uh, may not necessarily be. Uh, powerhouses, so to speak, but are definitely competitive. What uh, what do you see coming out of, of your bracket? You guys will get the winner of Parkway and Ridgemont, which, I mean, that in itself will be a, a competitive, interesting game. At least we hope it will be on paper and from what we've seen from both teams, it, look like, it, it looks like it will be. Um, what impressions do you get from what the bracket might hold for you guys moving forward? Yeah, so we'll get the, you know, obviously get the winner of Ridgemont Parkway. And I think they played each other to about eight points um, earlier in the year. Um, so obviously we played Parkway right at the turn of the new year. And um, I think we beat them by, I don't know, eight or so points. Hughes is a tough matchup. Uh, Slusher is a tough matchup. Um, they've got a couple other kids that are starting with younger guys that are starting to step up as well. Um, I don't honestly know much about Ridgemont. Um, I know they've got two or three really good players as well. A couple of them, I've heard, I've, our assistant coaches were talking that uh, over a thousand points, um, you know, and that's not easy to do. So, uh, you know, I think, you know, Perry, obviously Perry went up. Um, we went, we went away from Perry and then uh, St. Henry went up. So, you know, I think, you know, and then we knew New Bremen would probably come down in our bracket, which Bremen is playing as well as anybody, I think, right now. And, um, you know, they've gotten some nice wins. Obviously, they had a little hiccup on Saturday, but um, they've got some really nice wins on their resume here the second half of the season and playing well, extremely athletic um, uh, group group of kids there. So, um, um, but I also think Marion, you know, at the five seed, um, you know, they're nine and eight, five seed. They started 0 and 4. Obviously, a well coached team that, you know, they're going to guard you. And uh, I think their point guard and um, some of the other players around them, but, you know, Hank's a pretty good player too. So we'll see all that on our side of the bracket, um, which, you know, as I mentioned, kind of when I was previously talking about, it's going to be a tough, you know, tough road to hoe for anybody, um, you know, as you get not only sectional final, but in the districts. So Fort Recovery is another team. We played them last Friday and they're extremely athletic and they're good. Um, you know, they got the six seed. So, I mean, that's a tough out. I mean, St. Henry and uh, Fort Recovery playing in the sectional final. <laughs> that's a tough, uh, not to say, I mean, Fort Recovery's got to beat uh, Knoxville and St. Henry's got to beat Temple. Um, and Knoxville's got a, a couple of nice players as well. And they sound like they made a pretty good run at St. Henry the other night. So um, the other one that I know, um, we played them early, Spencerville. And they've got a really nice player. I know their big kid got hurt. Uh, coming into the year, so I think that kind of hurt him a lot. But um, you know, the Henline kid is a really nice player, and uh, they can do some damage because they're going to guard you. They're going to run a lot of a lot of good smart stuff offensively. So um, you know, there's a lot here. Um, you know, so between those teams that I just mentioned, I think uh, that's going to be interesting. And obviously, Lima Perry, um, they went on the road or not on the road, but they beat the, the Fort Laramie on Saturday, and Fort Laramie's no slouch. So. 
you know, you, uh, you got a good group of teams here, you know, and uh, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. You know, Mike, anytime you want to be a panelist on the selection show, just give me a call and, and we'll, we'll hook you up, man. If you're, if you're not doing anything else, we'll bring you on the show. <laughs> I'm good. I do love talking about this stuff, though. Sometimes I think we talk about it too much. You know, I was supposed to go back and coach our dang teams, but we're sitting here playing with all the brackets just because it's so much fun. You know, we think we're like in the NCAA or something. Right. Absolutely. Uh, I agree with you 100%. Basketball. <laughs> Mr. Head Coach Mike McClure, Coach, uh, best of luck to you in the uh, playoffs. Your next game or your next playoff, your first playoff game, rather, uh, coming up on the 25th or 26th of February. And you guys will get the winner of Parkway Ridgemont. Good luck in that game and good luck the rest of your season. Appreciate you having me on. Thank you very much. So you have those coaches that just say, hey, we're just look, focused on the next game, one game at a time. <laughs> Coach McClurg is down there in Minnesota game planning every single aspect of the bracket moving forward. Uh, he mentioned New Bremen, though, and we've talked about that a little bit while the interview was going on. And New Bremen, one of those teams, is, uh, again, looking like they are peaking at the right time or playing a lot better. New Bremen's got a four-point win over Marion Local. That is just going to be another <laughs> tremendous MAC-type basketball game. Physical defense with both teams and whoever puts some points on the board. Can Alex Ike score? Can Reese Busey score? Who's going to get points and which team wins? But it'll be a low scoring and it'll be a battle. And then Mr. with the big kid inside, they are just so hard to defeat. I love this district. And Absolutely. I mean, we, we were talking about Bremen and the success that they've had in football this year and this crop of senior athletes helping to lead the way on the basketball court. A team that last year finished over 500, made the districts a year ago. I think that they're, they're primed to make a run. I know that they would like to get a shot, perhaps, maybe at Marion Local again. You know, get into that district. They'd be opposite of, um, of Minster on the bracket. And they play the beginning of December when they finally got their football season championship uh, party over. I think they might still be partying down in the room with that, and I don't blame them one bit. But I believe it's either the first or second game, and Minster beat the brakes off of them. I don't know if that would happen a second time, but if anything, New Bremen will go down swinging. Well, Minster is a complete basketball team. We've talked. You mentioned Justin Nixon inside. Mm. His brother Johnny does a really nice job as well. And then they've got guard play. They've got some uh, some really good guys that can knock down uh, some shots outside. Justin Nixon can stretch the floor. He can shoot the three. Uh, he's obviously a, a big post up threat. And they're a real physical team. Per I love Perry's basketball team. Don't mm -hmm. get me wrong, but. Those MAC teams can be really, really tough to go up against. They beat up on each other throughout the year, and they'll surprise a couple tournament teams. So um, I, I wish all of them the best, yeah. uh, but I can't wait to watch this district. Uh, and a potential Perry Minster matchup would be so fun. Mm -hmm. I know they played earlier in the season, a really close game. Uh, I think Perry held Justin Nixon to about eight points. Uh, but that's two teams, very contrasting styles. Perry likes to push the tempo mm -hmm. a little bit. They'll, they'll run you full court on defense. And, uh, you know, Minster really wants to get down the court, get Justin Nixon into a good spot, and post him up. So uh, I'd love to see another, another game between those two. I think there's something really interesting that came out of that game because it's 42 40. Perry defeated Minster, yeah. which means Perry could play a Minster-style basketball game and still win. Mm. It didn't have to be a full-court pressure game, get out in transition, go to the rim, and do the types of things that Coach Sabre's team does so well. They were able to play a slower-paced game and still defeat Minster. That'll just be a super matchup if that, that game occurs. No doubt. And that's important for a team like Perry to discover because we're used to seeing that wide open game. It's like, no, can you slow it down when a team forces you to not score as many points or not run as wide open as they like to? Can you still be successful? And they showed that they can do that. They really did. That was at Perry. So, again, we're looking at a neutral floor. That will be a neutral floor. We'll get down to Wapak. So that will be a really good basketball game. But a lot of games to be played before you get to that point. Those two teams can't look ahead to, to that particular situation. Going to be in a very exciting district, as will most of them be, really, uh, here coming up in just a couple of weeks. Well, want to stop at one final district before we wrap up tonight. Going down into the southwest, the Piqua sectionals. Of course, Fort Loramie getting the three seed at 13 and 7. And Botkins has been on a roll. They stumbled a little bit a couple weeks ago, but they have uh, righted the ship, so to speak. Not that it was falling apart, to say the least, but at 17 and 3. And you got to really like their chances. 
against Bradford, against Houston, who got the buy in that particular sectional. It looks to be, it'll be Fort Loramie, Botkins once again, and Fort Loramie and Botkins have already had uh, some pretty great uh, matchups so far this year. Yeah, I always like to see when the when the one seed's playing in the first round instead of taking the bye. I, I, I've always been a, a fan of that, a fan of teams that just want to go out, they want to play, they, they don't want to take a break. Uh, it's always tough to practice for a full, what, week, week and a half leading up to your game just with the anticipation. So uh, that's pretty cool. You can see those, those two teams definitely want a shot at each other. Uh, really looking forward to that. Should be a good matchup between those two teams. Again, assuming they get there, they probably will. No offense to Ansonia, Riverside, or uh, Bradford, uh, or Houston, to say the least. Over on the bottom side of that bracket, as we take a look at the Pickwood 2 uh, sectional, Jackson Center sitting there at the two seed. Of course, they'll play Mississippi Valley. And with Fairlawn getting the bye, Newton, Rushi matching up in the 7-8, Troy Christian and Lehman Catholic matching up in the 5-4 matchup. Reached out to Pat Carlisle, coach of Lehman Catholic, unable to make the program, but asked him for uh, a comment. And in a, like, a very, like a very good coach that he is, he said, uh, we respect Troy Christian very much as they're heading into that next matchup. And Troy Christian's a good basketball team. And their future league mates as well with uh, Lehman and uh, Troy Christian both going to the Three Rivers League. Not to be confused with the Three Rivers Athletic Conference, which might cease to exist in a year. Very possible. And Jackson Center is sitting at that uh, two seed. And talk about needing to, to play to a particular tempo. Jackson Center does that to their opponents very well. Well, you know, they've got the really good post player in Reichert. And they've got Sosby runs a point guard for him. And as I said a couple games on the air, I think it's a law. You have to have a Sosby play at Jackson <laughs> Center. Because like every time we go down, there's a good Sosby playing for them. But then they've got a very good basketball team. They've got a good young player to go with them. you got a player like Reichert inside. you got a player like Sosby on the perimeter. You've got both areas covered. If you just get role players to do their job, and as well as Coach Elkert handles defense and game situations, Jackson Center is going to be a tough out in that particular district. Yeah, Coach, uh, Coach and I had the Jackson Center Bockings game yeah. earlier in the year, and you, you going against Jackson Center, it's like going to the dentist. I mean, it is tough. It is tough working against that defense, and they're so d dynamic on the defensive end, and they can run, really drain the clock. And on Bakken's side, boy, Jaden Pretty, when he's got the offense working, their offense is super pretty. 12 points a game, about five assists. Bakken's is a really tough team to play also. They're fun to watch, Bakken's they are. is. Mm -hmm. I'm a fan of what Sean Powell has done down there. Yeah. Um, you know, you mentioned Jaden Pretty, you know, the Plyman boys. You've got mm -hmm. Jamison Meyer into the mix, uh, who's a sniper, for lack yeah. of a better term, can hit the three. If he's open and he's in the gym, he's in range. Going to be a great set of matchups, and we're going to have a lot of these for you coming up in the next couple weeks over on WTLW right here on WOSN, WNHO as well, as we're going to bring you as much basketball as we can physically handle. That's really about <laughs> the best way to put it. We'll have the broadcast for you on our three networks. We'll have highlights on the sports report on Friday night. After those programs, we invite you to tune in and check out all of it. That is going to wrap up the WOSN selection show. I want to thank Mark Shine, Miles Holiday, Evan Skillerter, Aaron Matthews for helping us out. And we hope that you have a good rest of your evening. Good night. <laughs>